actually need the microphone, so. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Wes Rist. I want to welcome you to the American Society of International Law. Uh, this is our, at least our sixth year of cooperating with the Academy for Humanitarian Law and Human Rights from the American University of Washington College of Law on our summer human rights series. And we are very excited to be able to host this again. Um, it is a gem of our programming each year, and uh, the AUWCL folks do a wonderful job of bringing in high quality and high profile speakers from around the world to talk about incredibly timely issues. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with ASIL, we are a 111 year old professional membership association. We were actually founded by then Secretary of State Elihu Root under the Teddy Roosevelt administration. Um, at that point, it was pretty much the collection of all of the international lawyers in America, all 30 or 40 of them, uh, that would meet each year to talk about pressing issues uh, that were relevant to specifically the government. And, and they were kind of the think tank for the US government on international law issues. Since then, we have expanded quite dramatically, and we now are a professional membership association for anyone interested in international law, including non-lawyers. So we have quite a few interdisciplinary folks who are involved in the society as well. Uh, our membership focuses on a wide variety of topics. We have 35 different interest groups. Some of them are demographic in nature, some of them are substantive, some of them focus on geographic regions of the world. Um, but it covers everything from space law to law and technology, to law of the sea, to human rights, to private international law. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of, the sub, or some of the geographic areas focus on law of the Pacific Rim, um, Africa, uh, Europe, so there's a ton of diversity of areas in which you can get involved and get engaged if you're interested in learning more about the society. There are materials downstairs about how to become a member if you're not already. Um, and if you are a student or a new professional, the student rate is exceptionally cheap. And if you're a student at AU, it's 50% off of that because AU is an academic partner of the society. Uh, and we actually have a very robust career and professional development program for students and new professionals. So. Um, if you're interested, feel free to find one of us from ASOL afterwards to talk about that. Uh, without any further ado, because we want to get to the meat of this program, I'll turn things over to Claudia to introduce things on behalf of the Academy. Thank you very much, Wes. It's uh, always a pleasure to have this program with the American Society of International Law. We love to have our speakers and our students here. Um, we are going to have a series of three conferences this time as we do every year, and this is the first one. Uh, the topic is the backlash against regional human rights uh, systems and ongoing concern. Uh, many of you know that uh, both the inter American and the European systems have been under a lot of heat. Uh, and so we have uh, the pleasure and, the, uh, and we're very uh, happy this year we have these three speakers teaching in our program and we wanted to get them together to have a conversation on this very uh, particular issue. Um, this, is, uh, this conference is part of what we call Human Rights Month which is also a program uh, that we do every year as part of our three-week summer, uh, three summer program, the program of uh, advanced studies in human rights and humanitarian law. And you also have materials downstairs if you want to know about the program. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to leave uh, the floor to Elisa and David Marchand, who's going to uh, be the moderator of the panel. Thank you very much, Judge uh, Lopez Guerra and Ferrer for being here as well. So hello, everybody. It's very nice to see you for this panel. We want to thank uh, Washington College of Law and also the American Society of International Law for the work to put this together and, and give us this opportunity. The, the process of working towards the effective implementation of human rights is very much a learning process. It's very much built on shared reciprocal learning, the American Society of International Law, and the Washington College of Law play a really important role in sharing knowledge and in the learning process. And so they are excellent hosts for this particular event. In terms of our regional systems in the inter-American system, we've learned a great deal from the European system, both in terms of substantive standards, but also in terms of procedural questions like procedural delay, which is a, very much a priority for us right now. In terms of today's topic, the backlash against regional systems, I think all of us are aware that the topic reflects an underlying tension between the mechanisms to monitor compliance with human rights obligations and the very states that create 
the mechanisms. And it's a tension that's always present. It's an underlying current, let's say. But in some instances, it manifests itself more strongly. And in some instances, it manifests itself, this tension, in moments also of great political change or political uncertainty, which is, to an extent, I think, our situation right now. So the panel is particularly timely. We have two very distinguished panelists with us today who are going to help us have a better understanding of the backlash and its significance for our systems. We're going to begin with Judge Lopez Guerra, yes? And he is a judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights since 2008. You have some biographical information. Do you have a preference? No, it's okay. No. <laughs> um, so you have some biographical information already. I'm not going to review all of the distinguished background of our panelists, but I will just say that Judge Lopez Guerra has taught as a professor of constitutional law, among other universities at the Carlos III in Madrid. He served as magistrate and vice president of the Constitutional Court of Spain, vice president of the General Council of the Judiciary. He was a member of the Central Electoral Board, a member of the Assembly of Madrid, and also served as Secretary of State for Justice of Spain. And with that introduction, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good uh, afternoon to all of you all. Good for in Spanish terms, would be an early, early, uh, early afternoon. But anyway, yeah. I'm very much grateful for this invitation to have the, the opportunity to talk about some of the the problems that we have now in the in the European system of protection of human rights. And I'd like to, to start uh, commenting on this the title of this uh, this round table, which makes reference to to a back backlash in the international protection of, of human rights. And uh, I think the backlash is a very interesting uh, concept and, and it has been defined, and I, I, I read, uh, uh, this in mechanics, backlash is a jarring reaction or of striking back within a mechanism. Likewise, in social and political life, backlash has come to signify striking back in the form of a strongly negative reaction against something which is deemed to have gained popularity, prominence, influence, or, or power. Now, now, from this point of view, maybe the term uh, backlash uh, could be somehow applied to the present situation of the European system of international protection of, of, uh, of, human, of human rights, because the, 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 this European system has had a very rapid development and had generated the problem, problems and situations that were not initially uh, foreseen by the, by the creators of the system. There is a strong discussion now in, in, in Europe uh, uh, concerning the nature and the operation of the, of the, uh, of the system. And I think that uh, this, this discussion, I don't know whether it can be called backlash or not, uh, uh, can be understood looking a little at the evolution of the, the evolution of the of the system, you know, as you know, uh, uh, in the in this in the evolution of the European system, there are, have been two periods separated by the the, the well, the famous year 1989. Previous to that year, the the uh, let's see, the work of the system was rather uh, re reduced. Uh, there were not many many countries affected at the at the beginning, and most of the question dealt with referred to what uh, could be said, called something like the, the fine-tuning of, of human rights, concerning mostly the countries of Western Europe. Uh, however, uh, this system changed in a radical way after 1989. First, the number of countries introduced in the, in charters in the system grew in, up to in, at the moment, 40, 47 countries. The number of people under the jurisdiction of this country also grew to a uh, actually, more than more than a uh, hundred million. Uh, furthermore, the, the procedure changed. There is no filter for the applications. The individual application, the individuals can go directly to the to the court without passing the filter of the European Commission of of Human Rights, different from the from the inter-American uh, system. And as a result, the activity of the court also increased exponentially, uh, issuing hundreds and sometimes. 12, 13, 1400 rulings every, every year. 
So, of course, this increased activity of the court has a strong uh, consequences. Uh, problems piled up. There were, not only there was a backlog because of the number of applications, but also many countries consider that the, the activity of the court affected strongly the institutions, the, the, the very concept of, of sovereignty, the position of the states in the, in the international system was severely affected because of this uh, increased activity, increased number of uh, number of, uh, of, of rulings of the of the court that also has to deal with with more and more uh, intensive uh, questions concerning human rights. Now, this discussion up to what point the, this, this reaction can be called a backlash. I think that this has been and it's been a, a strong criticism of the of the system, but uh, I think that with different intensity. In some cases, the criticism is just uh, proposing solutions, uh, uh, what we can call a positive approach. In some other cases, it's more negative uh, concerning the very nature of the uh, of the of the system. Anyway, uh, this criticism, positive and negative, uh, have been formulated in two fora. Uh, there has been there has been we can call a collective discussion on the organization of the system, and there has been also a reaction at the national at the national level in individual in individual countries uh, concerning this uh, collective discussion or criticism by the initiative of the court there have been up to now four international conferences on the uh, on the working of the commission the, the 47 states have convened and have been well in Interlaken, in izmir in brighton in brussels and all the 47 countries have uh, made proposals and there has been a process of collective thinking on on how the system could be could be improved and the result has been uh, at least uh, two new protocols reforms of the of the convention trying to increase the internal efficiency and also to define exactly which are the roles and which are the different fields of jurisdiction of the strasbourg court and the national authorities uh, from this point of view, this uh, collective discussion, this conflict, uh, co collective you can say, brainstorming, we consider that uh, consider that has had a positive reaction. It's uh, improved the, the, the functioning of the of the uh, of the court. Now, but uh, I think that in this case, it will be different to difficult to speak about the backlash because, in general, the the states have reaffirmed the, 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 in this, in the final declaration of this conference, the state have reaffirmed their commitment to the to the convention, the need to, to continue with uh, its its work and I mean giving so to say a collective approval to the uh, to, to the system, including the direct access of citizens to the Strasbourg. Now near this collective reflection there have been also discussions more at the uh, national level in the different uh, in different countries and here uh, the situation is not so uh, let's see so uh, positive because this, the the criticism of the court at the national level has been i would say of three three types in some cases there's been a we can call a mild criticism adopting uh, by the national authorities uh, keeping their confidence and their support to the convention however adopting some kind of casus position concerning the application of the convention that would be the, the example of the case of italy for instance in some other cases a second type of, uh, of reaction has been more uh, uh, the criticism has been stronger public opinion has uh, been mobilized in some cases uh, against the working of the court and the convention even there have been some public uh, 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 the adoption of, of some motions by public organs criticizing somehow the the court but keeping instead keeping the, the the adherence the allegiance of the country to the uh, to the convention and finally there is been also a third type of a more intensive criticism we can say in which uh, there has been a direct confrontation by means of a formal declaration of the of national authorities uh, 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 in this in this respect uh, an example of the second type of this strong criticism but keeping the allegiance to the convention will be the united kingdom and an example of the third type of this uh, almost negative backlash uh, could be maybe the case of the russian the russian federation 
Now, looking at the first, uh, the first type, I think it's, the Italian case is interesting because it shows that the authorities, the, the, the powers of the, of the, of the country, uh, believe in the convention, are ready to support the convention, but with prudence. And I would put an, an example, the case of the, uh, of the Italian Constitutional Court. Uh, uh, the, the, the position of, of Italy in this aspect derives from uh, a, a question which is basic, not only for the European system, but also for the uh, inter-American system, which is the so-called control of conventionality. I mean, what happens when there is some contradiction between some internal legal norm and a convention norm? Now, who decides uh, whether, admitting that there is a primacy of international law, a primacy of the convention, who decides whether uh, uh, the, the convention must be applied or the internal law must be, must be applied? Uh, in, and then the question in Italy was posed as uh, the, we can call the um, concentrated or diffuse control of conventionality. I mean, when a judge normally found in a case that there was a contradiction between the convention and the internal law, could the judge just apply the convention and not apply the internal law? This is the, the main thing. Well, the answer is interesting. The answer by the Constitutional Court uh, uh, really was uh, decisive. The Italian Constitutional Court, in two, in two, in two uh, judgment, established that yeah, certainly the convention was superior, the, the binding force of the superior or the convention was superior to internal laws because the constitution established clear, clearly this, this situation. So that there was a hierarchy of norms, the convention and internal laws established by uh, article, article 115 of the constitution. As a result, if parliament or regional parliament or national parliament approve the law were con contrary to the convention, that law would become unconstitutional because the constitution established the need for this agreement. So that, again, the, in case of contradiction, the uh, convention should, apply, should be applied and not the internal law. So it looks like very protective and very progressive, but there is a catch because uh, in the Italian system, the only court who can declare the unconstitutionality of a law is the constitutional court, not the, or, in, any ordinary judge. So when some uh, ordinary court finds there is this uh, contradiction, this court cannot just apply the convention and not apply the internal law. The, this court has to raise a question to the constitutional court asking whether there is such a contradiction and asking the constitutional court to declare that the internal law is not applicable. So that with this system, the, the constitutional court became the filter, the protector, so to say, of the convention. The ordinary court could not apply uh, the convention instead of the internal law. So, the, of course, the convention is very important. The convention has a hierarchical position uh, very high, but application really is under the control of the uh, constitutional court. So, they, are, they accept the supremacy of the primacy of the convention, but only under this uh, decision by, by the court. So it's a prudent system in order to avoid that any court or any judge decided to apply the convention and to disapply internal, internal, internal norms. So I think that's an example of this uh, cautious, cautious approach. Now, uh, this reaction can be considered mild, mild, but there are reactions which are uh, stronger, in which there has been uh, not only an opposition between norms, but also a reaction by public opinion and sometimes by uh, uh, official of, of our, by state uh, 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 organs. And I think the United Kingdom is a good example of this kind of a strong criticism, keeping without, within the bounds of the, of the convention. Now, uh, uh, if you remember, the, the, the um, conflict between the United Kingdom and the court started as a result of a judgment of the court in the first, uh, the first case in, 2000, in 2005. Uh, in this case, the court uh, considered the United Kingdom had violated Article 3 of the protocol of the convention, recognizing the right to free, to free election. And uh, the claim had been presented by Mr. Hitz to the, to the court. Uh, this man had been sentenced to life prison for months, mass slaughter. 
Then, according to the Representation of the People Act, uh, he has been deprived of his right to vote in, in any election. According to this, uh, to this law, all, all convicted prisoners uh, uh, are, without exception, uh, disfranchised, they are disqualified from voting. No, no sentenced prisoner, no matter what is the extent of the, of the judgment, uh, can, uh, can vote. And then the court in Hearst uh, considered this blanket prohibition of all prisoners to vote was disproportional, and then as a result, it was contrary to the right to vote, and uh, 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 consider that in the case of Hearst, due to this blanket, uh, blanket uh, uh, prohibition, the United Kingdom had violated this, uh, this right. Now, this uh, Hearst, uh, the, the, the decision has a very uh, negative uh, reaction, by the, mostly by the tabloid press, by the uh, public, uh, public opinion, and uh, uh, really uh, the, the, the British government didn't act in, in any way, in, in any consequences, Uh, uh, the government said, that, well, they, anyway, they will try to pass new legislation, but uh, the thing is that uh, there were uh, new elections in 2015, all the legislative process was stopped, and as a result, uh, nothing was done. So we are in a situation of, uh, let's see, of uh, impasse uh, uh, between the United Kingdom and, uh, and, and, and the court. Uh, this impasse, one must say, is not from the practical point of view is not uh, uh, too important for one reason. First, uh, well, two reasons. First, uh, the court, since uh, Hirsch, has uh, kind of changed a little uh, its uh, position, in Scopola, considering that it is legitimate, it is not contrary to the convention, to deprive prisoners of the right to vote, but in a proportional way. I mean, instead of a blanket prohibition, depriving the, the, of some prisoners with, with very high sentences, with very high uh, uh, terms of prison. In the, that case, it was uh, legitimate to deprive them of the right to vote, but not in this kind of general indiscriminate uh, uh, prohibition. So that at least there is some change. Even the, the, the United Kingdom Supreme Court has quoted this, uh, in, this in some cases, accepting this, this position uh, to, justify, to justify some some sentences, but also from the practical point of view, and here and later in Greens, the court didn't allow any economic compensation. They recognized the violation. The court considered the recognition of the violation was compensation enough and did not allow any, any economic compensation to the, to the applicant. As a result, the number of applicants coming to the court has decreased enormously. So mm -hmm. we don't have a reality. There is not a practical problem concerning it. But the problem is 
is deeper. The question is that uh, uh, the, the point to discuss is the supremacy of, of parliament and really up to what point the, the sovereignty of parliament is, is, being, is, being, is being affected. One must to say that must say that the, the problem is not uh, the quality of human rights in Great Britain. Great Britain, uh, the United Kingdom was one of the creators of the convention. Uh, they, they translated the convention into the internal system with the Human Rights uh, Human Rights uh, uh, Act. And normally, well, as you know, the level of human rights in the United Kingdom is very high. The problem is is more to say uh, 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 concerns the fact that the, somehow the, the British legal opinion doesn't like very much what we can call the evolutive approach of the uh, case law of the of the Strasbourg Court. The idea that, uh, the, 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 that somehow the convention is a living instrument and the service sala must be interpreted in a creative way, taking into account the new challenges to, to human rights. And that, from the point of view of the, uh, you can say, British uh, uh, legal doctrine, there is very, I recommend you to read an article by Lord, Lord Hoffman, or 2000, 2009, when he considered that really the internal courts are far better qualified to, to, uh, to, to, to de decide on questions of human rights more than a foreign, so to say, a foreign, a foreign court. The question then is posed. There is a, a situation in which uh, uh, the United Kingdom is still a member of the convention. It complies con la, with the with the judgments of the convention, but there is this, uh, so to say, a problem of principle. And from time to time, there are British politicians who announce their intention to retire, to, to withdraw from the convention, but up to now, the situation is severe criticism, but uh, I mean, uh, somehow the, the, the United Kingdom is complying with its uh, duties. Now, the, the most um, worrying, I would say, example of criticism within the the system is the one of the the Russian uh, the Russian Federation. I mean, in the United Kingdom, after all, the the answer of the uh, to hears has been the uh, legal inactivity. They don't have passed any any law reforming the reforming the, the uh, all, all this this the question concerning the prison the, the prison reporting. But in the Russian Federation, there has been a formal reaction, which. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a still, I mean, it uh, doesn't mean a, a frontal confrontation, but at least it's somehow worrying from, from the court point of view. No, the, the, uh, the origin is, a, is a, a judgment of the court very similar to his, the case uh, Anshurov, uh, Anshurov versus Russia, where there were the same problem. I mean, the, all the prisoners were uh, the sentenced prisoners, convicted prisoners were deprived of uh, the right to vote. The problem in Russia was that this, uh, this prohibition did not derive from the law, from on the statute, but derived directly from the constitution, from Article 32 of the of the Russian of the Russian Constitution. So, uh, uh, when when the, the the court considered this blanket prohibition, it was against the, the convention. It was clear there was some contradiction between the convention and the Russian and the Russian uh, uh, the Russian Constitution. Now, the, the initial reaction in Russia was that a group of deputies, a member of the Duma, of the Russian parliament, presented a claim to the constitutional court, Russian constitutional court, asking uh, to declare the convention or the law approving the convention to declare, declare this law unconstitutional because it was a direct confrontation with the, with the, with the constitution. Now, the constitutional court rejected this claim, okay, there, was, there was not inconstitutionality, but included in, in his judgment a, a affirmation that the, the parliament had the possibility of enacting legislation who would uh, prohibit execution of, of uh, Strasbourg uh, uh, judgment when they were contrary to the constitution. They said, no, there's no problem, but of course, in the future, parliament can legislate uh, reducing the effects of the convention of the, of the Strasbourg of the Strasbourg Court, of course. Well, it was clear that what happened immediately. The government, uh, the Russian government, presented the law in Parliament, precisely reducing reducing this uh, uh, the, the, this this, uh, this this uh, this possibility. And uh, this law gave the government the the power to go to the Constitutional Court, asking for non-execution of a uh, of of a. Uh, 
of a judgment. So the government could say, well, we have a judgment against Russia, let us, the constitutional court, whether we can execute it or not. And of course, once approved this law, immediately the government went to the Russian constitutional court asking explicitly whether the judgment in Anchurov could be executed or whether it was impossible to execute being a contrary to the constitution. And uh, the constitutional court said effectively, uh, Article 32 of the Russian constitution established this blanket prohibition of vote for convicted prisoners, so Anchurov was not, uh, could not be executed in the in the Russian in the Russian Federation. So uh, this situation would initially look like a direct direct challenge. Uh, however, one must say also that this challenge is somehow reduced because of the uh, 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 position of the Russian Constitutional Court. And I think here it's important to talk about one thing called you know the dialogue between courts. Because certainly the Russian Constitutional Court knew that there was a confrontation direct with Strasbourg. So in order to avoid that, they say something very interesting. They say, well, according to the to the present Russian law, uh, well, uh, any 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 prisoner uh, convicted cannot cannot vote. But in order to not to to have a, a, a direct confrontation with the convention, we must remember that the Strasbourg Court established that somehow, if there were some proportionality between and between the, 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 the sentence, the prison, the prison sentence, and the deprivation of vote, that, that would be admissible. So what the, government, the Russian government could do, the, the Russian parliament could do, would be to eliminate, to eliminate the, the imprisonment, the, the sentences or the penalties of imprisonment in minor crimes. So, if in minor crimes uh, there is no prison, and, and then the imprisonment is only in, several, in more grave crimes, there, there will be a proportionality, and then depriving people in prison of the right to vote wouldn't go against the, uh, the, 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 the convention as interpreted by Strasbourg. So, the Russian court somehow sent back the, the ball, so to say, to the, to the Russian government to say, well, this uh, specific answer of a uh, uh, a uh, sentence cannot be executed by the parliament can do something in order to avoid confrontations in the future. Here again, there is not an individual problem because the, the applicant, Anchorov, was released and he didn't receive any economic compensation. He was released and he can vote again. So there is not individual problem. The problem is whether or not the Russian parliament is going or not uh, to uh, modify the criminal code in order to make possible uh, to eliminate this, this confrontation. I think, uh, to, to, uh, to, to finish with this position, that I think that we could, uh, mm. we could uh, 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 draw at least two conclusions, I think. Uh, one is that, I mean, looking at all this, uh, this question, is that somehow conflict or discussion is not to be considered always something negative. I think it can be, on the contrary, it can be considered as the government uh, take, uh, take into account the, the, the evolution of the Strasbourg, uh, Strasbourg case law in a system of uh, uh, different levels of control. It's normal up to some point there are differences of view in the different levels. And if there is this kind of discussion, it's because somehow the system is alive and it's going ahead and, and, and somehow it's a show of, of vitality. But of course, the, the second conclusion would be that it is that, that would be true if. Uh, if uh, at both level, the national and the international level, there is a, a will to find solution and to go into this kind of dialogue uh, between between courts. I think that uh, 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 the idea of the convention has been some kind of uh, shared or joint uh, activity of states and uh, and, and, and Strasbourg is the idea that somehow keeps in the basis of the of the uh, system. I would say that. Uh, uh, all these examples, the three examples, show that uh, if there are problems within the, the convention, there are problems that do not uh, are equivalent, I would say, to a backlash, but uh, uh, equivalent to, to a reaction in order to improve the system to find to find a way. And at the, at the last uh, uh, instance, uh, there is not only the, the letter of the law, but I would say that the wisdom of the prudence of the of the parties involved, which is a really really important. So let's hope that all these things will turn out for the for the better. Yeah, thank you.
I think to work in human rights, one has to be an optimist, no? So we do hope for the best. Mm -hmm. And we continue with our, with our distinguished uh, panelists, with Judge uh, Ferrer McGregor, whom we know in the Inter-American Commission, we know him in two contexts. We know him as a judge of the Inter-American Court since 2013, as the court's current vice president. But we also know Judge Ferrer McGregor and his role as professor of constitutional law at the UNAM, the National Autonomous University in Mexico, and as a researcher at the Institute of Legal Research, where he coordinates the area of research on constitutional law. And he's also a professor for the master's degree in constitutional law and human rights at the Pan American University. He's been a visiting professor and completed research stage, stays in multiple Latin American and European universities, and has authored over 100 articles and books on human rights and constitutional law, and coordinated the collection Justicia Intermericana, Inter-American Justice. So you have this special welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, for your kind introduction. And uh, of course, thanks to the American Society of uh, International Law and the Academy of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law of the American U University College of Law. Thank you, Claudia Martin. Thank you, Diego Rodriguez Pinzon. And thank you, every one of you, because uh, uh, you're here in lunch time, no? <laughs> we don't have problems in Spain or in Mexico because we have lunch at three o'clock, no? Something like that. <laughs> but in most uh, Latin American countries and in the US, they, they have right now lunch. So thank you very much to spend your time here. And uh, well, I feel honored to share this panel with my friend, me, with my good and admired friend, uh, Judge Luis Lopez Guerra of the European, European Court of Human Rights and with our moderator, Elizabeth from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Since these type of events uh, are privileged spaces to discuss the important question to the regional protection of human rights. And, and one of these questions is, that is the matter of concern as the title of this panel suggests, the backlash against regional human rights system. The emphasis of my short presentation uh, is mainly uh, from my perspective as judge of the Inter-American uh, Court of Human Rights. So during the next few minutes, I will present some insights about what I consider to be the most important, I prefer to call challenges than backlash, because I think a lot of them are at the beginning of the system or at the beginning of the history of the court. I don't know if we're in backlash or we're trying to uh, advance in some challenges faced by the intermic and human rights systems, and how these challenges might be even more difficult to get through because of the political environment that has surrounded the court and the commission during the last few years. So um, I will divide my presentation in five parts. When I was preparing this presentation in these days, I make a list of six, 57, <laughs> but don't worry, I just choose five. Uh, first, I will talk about what we may call institutional ch challenges. No? Second, institu institutional challenges, I will talk about four issues. D second, I will refer to the need to continue working for the achievement of the universality of inter inter-American system. It's a huge difference from uh, the European Court of Human Rights. That means that all the countries, members of the OAA, should be fully part of the inter-American system. Third, I will discuss about some substantive aspects of the law that I think need to be developed both at the political and the judicial spheres. For example, the recognition of new rights. And fourth, I will talk about the need to create mechanisms to increase the level of compliance with the decisions of the Inter-American Court. Finally, I will conclude reflecting on how some of these aspects have been hindered by the reaction that some political actors in the context of the OAS. So let's move on, the first uh, part, institutional challenges. I'm sorry, like a Josh to talk about this issue, budget, no? Uh, every international tribunal is highly dependent on one crucial aspect for its proper function, the monetary and other material resources it needs. In this sense, it is well known for everyone that one of the greatest difficulties faced by the inter-American system is the 
the scarcity of resources with which he has to carry out his functions. In this regard, by way of, of example, uh, the budget of the European Court, maybe Luis can tell us more about this, is 20% of the Council of Europe, uh, the Council of Europe budget, with a contribution of 71 million of euros, 80 million of dollars, no? while the combined budget of the um, Inter-American Commission and the Inter-American Court represents approximately 10% or less than 10% of the budget of the Organization of American States. It should also be noted that this less than 10% of the OES budget covers only 50% of the Commission's expenses around and 50% of the uh, expenses of the Court. In 2016, the budget with which the Inter-American Court worked was approximately, approximately 4.5 million, only 2.7 of regular OAS budget. So the rest was uh, uh, contributions and external donations that can be one year and the other one, they can not go, come. <clears throat> no? So making a comparison between the three regional human rights courts the Inter-American Court is, one, is the one that has fewer resources. The budget of the African Court is approximately $10 million, while the European Court, as I mentioned, was $80 million. But if we add the budget of the Committee of Ministers, Committee of Ministers, no? uh, it goes almost 40% uh, in human rights in the um, Council of Europe uh, budget. So there's huge differences in these aspects. Um, ideally, the entire budget of the court and the commission has to uh, come from the regular fund of the OAS, has to be found by the states, and therefore it should not rely on external funding, especially in these troubled, troubled times when international cooperation has been significantly reduced, particularly by the problems that Europe and other countries are facing. Due to this problem, the cooperation with Latin America has been severely curtailed. In that sense, we are confident that in the next General Assembly of, of the OAS, which will take place uh, less than a month in Mexico, in Cancun, the regular budget for both Commission and the Court could be increased. It might double the regular budget, that's a proposal that has been supported by Mexico and other uh, countries. We are confident that it will happen. Hope so. The budget has to be predictable and sustainable, previsible y sostenible. That's the minimum that um, we hope as a tribunal. You know? And that's it's incredible, but what, that's one of our main problems right now. Second, that the, uh, the second issue related to the budget also, the need that the Inter-American Court, and of course the Commission too, becomes a permanent court, a permanent commission. Former Judge Manuel Ventura Robles from Costa Rica emphasized the need to transform the Inter-American Inter -American Court in, into a permanent court as its uh, counterpart in the European system. I absolutely agree. In fact, since the court was created nearly 40 years, next, time, next year we're, we're celebrating 40 years of the American Convention and 40 years of the creation of the court, this possibility was discussed at the OAS no, 40 years ago. And it was almost accepted for one vote, almost accepted 40 years ago, that the judges of the court should be of exclusive dedication. However, travelite that only the secretary would sit permanently at the court. In this sense, it is important to remember that the judges of the Inter-American Court do not work full time in San Jose. That's why he, I'm here at the American University <laughs> College of Law teaching. And uh, I, it's important to remember also that Article 72 of the American Convention established that the judges of the court and the members of the commission should receive emoluments and travel allowance in the form and under the conditions set 
forth in their status with due regard for the importance and independence of their office. On average, the judges meet between 10 and 12 weeks a year, distrib uh, distributed in ordinary and extraordinary sessions. I think this is far from being optical. In the same vein, the former president of the Inter-American Court and current judge of the International Court of Justice, Antonio Cansado Trindade, referred to the work as the as an inter-American judge, as a real apostolate, real apostolate, because, because it implied combining the work in the inter-American court and the de dedication to his permanent professional activities in his country. And it is true. The work of the judges at the sessions is mainly intended for hearings to resolve contentious cases, advisory opinions, provisional measures, and monitor monitoring compliance with the judgment. This consented workload is exhausting from a logistical and intellectual level, and it also affects the efficiency of the tribunal. Full-time judges, full-time judges with exclusive dedication to the court would certainly strengthen the fulfillment of our judicial duties. Third, the need for transparency in the appointment and voting for commissioners and judges of the inter-American system. Um, the election of judges corresponds uh, to the vote of the ma majority of the state's parties to the, um, to the convention in the General Assembly. Regarding the election process, Founders Ledesma has strongly denounced long ago that the election is the result of the vote exchange between governments. So the vote for, uh, so the vote for specific candidates may be con conditional, conditioned and highly polit politicized. Another problem in this regard is that there are no rules on the geographical distribution of judges beyond the requirement that they must be nationals of, the, of one of the states party of the OAS and that there cannot be two judges of the same nationality, which increase the level of discretion in the election process. With these rules in the place, the most successful states in terms of appointment judges have been Costa Rica, Colombia, and Venezuela, with four, each one, followed by Mexico and Uruguay, with three. On the contrary, other states have never appointed a judge in the court, such as Bolivia, El Salvador, Guatemala, or Paraguay, for some examples, in order to increase the degree of transparency and publicity in the processes, and therefore reduce the political component of the election process, different political bodies in other regions have adopted rules, either in their foundational documents or in sub subsequent resolution, like in Europe, like in other, uh, uh, we can talk, if you like, in some example in the Q&A questions. In this regard, there, wa there was a positive precedent in past election for members of the Inter-American Commission and Inter-American Court and since the candidate appeared uh, publicly in a session of the Permanent Council of the OAS to present their positions on the goals and objectives um, they would uh, pursue if elected for office. Both the state and representatives of uh, civil society had the opportunity to ask questions to the candidates. In fact, a process of this nature is currently being carried out for candidates to the Inter-American Commission right now. There are six nominations for three vacancies, and as we all know, the new commissioner will be chosen at the next OAS Assembly, General Assembly in Mexico. This is cer certainly, I believe that, a good practice, and it would be advisable for this experience to, to be institutionalized and therefore repeat for the next election of judges and commissioners, and why not? Maybe the OAS can rule about that. Four, increasing the plurality of the candidates for commissioners and judges in the inter-American system. While all mechanisms for selection members of international tribunals are subject to criticisms and subsequent uh, refinement, the inter-American system is behind in improving the select process of its members, while other international tribunals have developed more sophisticated guidelines and rules to promote a greater level of representativeness. 
the composition of the Inter-American Commission of the, and of the Inter-American Court is one of the fundamental pillars on which the legitimacy and effectiveness of the Inter-American human rights system rests. This month, the Inter-American system will elect members of the Inter-American Commission, as I said before, and for this reason, this subject becomes particularly relevant, relevant because greater representativeness uh, promotes inclusion of members with different backgrounds, languages, and experiences, as well as, as ensuring that the promotion bodies are representative of the region in which they operate. I'm convinced that a diverse judicial system is an indisp indispensable requirement for any democracy and also for the inter-American system. But there have been historical deficiencies in this regard. For example, maybe I have, I don't know if I have uh, the correct numbers, but I try to do it. The, in the commission, since 1959 until 2017, until today, out of 71 persons who have integrated this body, only 13 women have held the post, the post of commissioners. Eight members have been Afro-descendants, and no person who has belonged to an indigenous people has ever held this position. Regarding the court, since its establishment in 1979, only five women have been members of the tribunal, three Afro-descendants and no indigenous people. Currently, the court does not have any jurists who represent the common law legal tradition. All members have civil legal training, and there is just one woman currently seated at the court. Um, let's move on to another issue, another challenge. Uh, promote and achieve the universality of the inter-American system through the ratification and acceptance of the contentious jurisdiction of the inter-American court. With the withdrawal of the American Convention on Human Rights by Trinidad and Tobago in 1999 and Venezuela in 2013, only 23 out of 35 countries are subject to the American Convention and only 20 countries are subject uh, to the contingent jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court. So right now, the Inter-American Court is really a Latin American court, only 20 out of 35. In Europe, 47 out of 47. <laughs> so um, the lack of universal, universality of the inter-American system or, originate by the non-ratification of the American Convention of Human Rights by 10 OAS member states, almost all English speaking, is very important. First, because it affects the representativeness of the system itself, and because two of uh, these states are Canada and the United States of America, two of the most relevant economic and political actors in the region. But I, I think they, they signed it, but they, don't, they have not ratified it, yes. The absence of countries that are so important to the system affects its credibility, since not only two key partners of the inter-American system are missing, but also the representative block of common law in our continent. The last state to ratify the Pact of San Jose was Dominica in 1993, almost 25 years ago. So we need to continue with our effort to increase the additional of all members of the OAS to the American Convention, and of course, to recognize and accept the jurisdiction of the courts. Third, or four, or three, or five, I don't know what. <laughs> the recognition and development of new rights. We have norms in the uh, interpretation norms, Article 29.9b, that I think is very, very important. It says that the American Convention provides that no provision of the Convention should be interpreted as restricting, restricting the enjoyment of exercise of any right of freedom recognized by virtue of the laws of any party or by virtue of another convention to which one of the, the say states is party. In this sense, the Inter-American Court at the beginning of this new millennium, millennium began to interpret more uh, broadly the rights enshrined in the Convention. Just for two or three examples, 
Uh, in the case uh, Milagran Morales, Street Children, caso eh, Los Niños de la Calle versus Guatemala, the court considered that the right to life contemplated in the Article 4 of the Pact of San Jose should not only be protected under the classical concept of depriving a person of his or her life. On the contrary, the court considered that the right to life encompasses a much broader concept, the right to a dignified life, vida digna, vida digna, which impl implies all those elements necessary for the full development of an individual. I know this is a controversial issue, but that was long ago that the court did that. On the other hand, the court also recognized groups as holders of human rights protected under the convention. In this sense, from the first case, the indigenous people was Aguastigny community versus Nicaragua in 2001, the court has considered that indigenous people have collective owned ancestral alliance and that this ownership is protected under Article 21 of the American um, Convention. Uh, Another pending question that is in the Inter-American Court needs, that I need, I think, needs to address is the enforcement of rights that have historically been considered as second or third generation rights. I think the court has, to, has not paid too much attention to economic, social, and cultural rights enshrined in the additional protocol to American Convention or Protocol of San Salvador. It has not chosen it has not chosen to develop this group of rights autonomously, and on the contrary, it has only declared violations to civil and political rights in connection with social rights. That's the traditional view. Right now, it's a new relatoria in this issue. No, I think it's working now. No, it's a, about to be made. About to be made. Yes. So maybe that's the future. I don't know. <laughs> In this regard, uh, we have uh, important recent cases, and for the say, first time in Gonzalez Luis versus Ecuador, the court declared a violation of a provision providing the additional protocol of the American Convention of Human Rights in the area of economic, social, and cultural rights. In the case, the court found a violation to the right of education, the, for the first time, right of education enshrined in Article 13 uh, of the aforementioned protocol. I don't have time to, to talk about this important case, but that's a new view, I think, in the jurisprudence of the court. Um, fourth, or I don't know. Creation of a domestic, a domestic uh, mechanism for enforcement of the Inter-American Court's resolution. Of 210 cases, approximately, in which the court has declared the international responsibility of one of the states to the convention at the end of 2016, only 210 cases. How many cases do you handle uh, a no. year? This is in 40 years. In one year? We have, we have that in two months or something. So, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> 1,000, it's wonderful. Well, in, in his history, 40 years, only 1050 cases. No? Well, um, at the end of two, 2016, 186 cases are still under supervision of compliance. That is, with the, with the first judgment of the merits in 1988 in the case of Velázquez Rodríguez versus Honduras, almost 30 years ago, only 24 cases have been complied uh, internally. That is 50% 50, 50 of all the cases at the court. Obviously, this represents a very low rate of compliance by state that have been declared internationally responsible for human rights violations. The judgments of the Inter-American Court in contentious cases are binding and, in addition, enforceable. Yet, one of the topics in which little has been said is how should the judgment of the Inter-American Court should be enforced by domestic authorities. Thus, the need to create international procedural mechanism requires a deep reflection by domestic and international lawyers alike. That is especially uh, truth because um, 
um, because uh, proposals for enforcement mechanism must consider a very delicate matter. Identity, the problem of e execution of the inter-American judgment when, they, when the same questions were previously presented before the judiciary at the domestic level. This particular question has created some tensions with cases such as Hellman versus Uruguay, or more recently, Ponte Vecchia versus Argentina. So um, by, by way of, of conclusion, I would like to point out that both the Commission and the Court must address these challenges in an environment that is not always favorable, favorable, favorable. <laughs> Budgetary and transparency issues sometimes are affected by political and ideological interests. Something similar happens with issues connected uh, to the signing and ratifying uh, of the American Convention and acceptance of the course contentious jurisdiction. States are not always ready to be supervised by a super, uh, supranational body that might affect as aspects connected with human rights question, especially those that are controversial at the state level. In the case of the uh, acceptance of new rights, it is controversy that most take place in the judicial and political sphere, sphere both with new and creative interpretation of the American Evolution, the American Convention, and with the adoption of new treaties. In this last aspect is perhaps where the Commission and the Court has more room for maneuver. In any case, whether in the budgetary, political, or substantive discussions, I am convinced that the guide of our actions must always be the creation of new paths, dialogues, for a better and broader protection of human rights in our continent. Thank you very much. Our panelists have put on the table a wide range of different issues, challenges, backlashes. Um, we do have some time for questions and comments. And I have a microphone and I have a lot of questions. They're not 57. <laughs> um, but I think we'd like to open the floor. Um, Yes. Are we doing microphones? Okay. Thank you, thank you, everybody, for the very interesting um, um, conference presentation conference that you gave us. Um, very, uh, very important, especially in the framework of the court and the European system. My question is about um, one subject that is is been playing a playing a very important role the last ten months in this country. This is I'm talking about immigrants, not only in this country, Caribbean countries and Europe. So, what is the position of the European Court because that happens there, and how is the position from the Inter American Court? I remember that in the past. There, I don't know if there's still the um, uh, consultoria, and the, what, is, what are they doing in this case? And um, I know there were a couple of cases as well, talking about uh, people who didn't have the right to have the nationality uh, for many reasons, uh, but uh, behind all this point was the problem of immigration. So I would like to have your opinion. Um, I would consult our panelists. I think maybe we could take a couple of questions and then have a round of responses. Okay. So maybe we'll take another question. Christina. Um, also, thank you for your presentations. Um, my question is to Judge Lopez Guerra. Um, with all of the reforms of the European system, the thing that has puzzled me most for a long time is the creation of basically five chambers to do clone cases or repetitive cases, which must be terribly boring for the judges. And I remember Judge Wilhaber used to say when questioned about this, well, every individual has the right to have this case heard by the European court. But in fact, you discard about 35% of 
95% of the cases because they don't they don't meet admissibility requirements. So everybody is not getting their case heard by the European court. And once you've decided a case, why can't the court devolve some system of precedent to send the cases back to, I think you did that with Italy, with the, with the Le Pinto, that if you had a certain amount of delay in the case, then you got a certain amount of money. Um, and that kind of worked. But um, why do you have a mechanism for repetitive cases? Maybe this is a good time to, to have some response. Okay. The questions are fairly complex. Well, it, it, it concerning the two, the, if I understand, the first question refers to the problem of Im immigration. I mean, of the well, uh, uh, I must say that uh, uh, the uh, the court has uh, the court has had the opportunity in the last the last uh, the last years to give some some rulings on this matter, which is becoming more and more relevant, of course, because of the economic crisis and so on. Now, um, let's see. The the convention as such does not recognize the right of one person to live in a different country with, 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 from its uh, origin. I mean, doesn't give it, you don't have the right, there is not a civil right to live in a country different from, different from, from yours. So as a result, uh, the, the court the, uh, considers that as there is not a civil right, there are not procedural rights to be applied. That is to say that an immigrant cannot say, listen, I have been expelled without due process and so on. You don't have a civil right to be here, so there is not a, a, a procedural guarantee. But this is the theory. But there are many other rights which are affected by the fact of one being being expelled. Mostly, mostly the, the main one is uh, the right derived from Article 8, which refers mostly to family, family life. And what happens when people who have uh, entered the country, Illegally, they have created f uh, families, a uh, family relationship that have been living for a lot of time. Then uh, the authorities consider that the situation is illegal, and they might be might be uh, expelled. Well, the court in this case, uh, in with this is one of the reasons for discussion with the United Kingdom, has considered the rights of Article Eight, the rights of uh, family of of uh, family life, can be affected by disproportionate expulsions for rejection to enter in a country. And, and as a result, the court in many cases uh, has considered that, that uh, although there is not a right to live uh, in a country, there is a right to have some uh, to have family life. And if this family life is uh, consolidated, established, then it cannot be in a disproportionate way uh, broken. It, there might be a specific, a very clear reasons for a state to do to that. That is one one aspect. Second aspect. Uh, of course, many of the people who are refugees or who come from countries where there are uh, civil wars or situations of, of confrontation, they can say that if they go back to their countries, there is a small, strong risk for their integrity and for their life. So here, the right affected is the right of Article 3 of Article 2 of the Convention not to be deprived of life or not to be subject to inhuman, inhuman treatment. If some person, by being sent back to his country or her country, risk this, uh, this, this, these dangers, then, of course, the state is uh, violating these uh, this, uh, 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 guarantees. So that, in principle, uh, they are, in the court, we have, we can say, some kind of, of uh, scale of, of countries in which we look very carefully in cases of, of deportation, of refusal of, of asylum. This is not the same thing in Somalia, for instance, that in uh, Egypt. Well, but you have to look at all these things and see what are the problems. And third, the third point, I think this question is very complicated. I could talk for hours. But uh, there is another question, very important also lately, because of the uh, big uh, refugees and uh, waves of Im immigrants coming through the Mediterranean, which is uh, Protocol 4, which forbids collective expulsions. I mean, it's, you know, with, exactly what is the meaning of collective expulsion? It's not expelling a lot of people together, that's one aspect, but is the thing of expelling someone without knowing which are their individual characteristics. I mean, the taking someone, if you listen, we don't want you to come here, you're in the country, but we expel you. We don't care who are you and where you're doing, exactly. We just expel you as, as, as an individual, an, an name individual. For instance, there is an interesting case, Hirsi Yama against Italy, 
in which the the ship of the of the Italian fleet just uh, intercepted the, a ship of, of people, hundreds of people coming from Libya, and uh, this ship just take them, all of them, and without identification of any type, just rejected them and sent back to Libya, although they were already in an Italian ship, so they were other Italian jurisdictions. Such, such collective expulsions are completely uh, forbidden by the by the uh, by the uh, by the court. Now the problem is that the principle is that there is no right to immigrate. That's uh, I think that's uh, that's important. So you have to look always case by case to see whether some other violations are are are, are produced. This is one of the big problems I tell you. For instance, in Spain now, to put an example, uh, Spain has two uh, cities in the north of Africa, which are in Morocco. And, and there is a very strong pressure, immigration pressure, mostly from sub-Saharan people. Uh, the Spanish government has made an enormous, enormous wall in order to, to, to stop the people from entering. But many people just enter, jump the wall, and go into Spanish territory. And in, uh, the, the, the Spanish police decided to give an order saying that Spain did not consider that the Spanish territory a part of the, of the land uh, contiguous to the wall. As a result, they will expel them thinking that they are not in Spanish territory. But of course, that's a problem. The problem posed is that whether this is not a violation of the prohibition of collective expulsion, because the person, the person who just jumped the wall, they just, just <laughs> expel without identification of any type. Uh, I must say that this is a case law in, 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 in development. And it's causing some some problems with the uh, United Kingdom, uh, some with countries which are now in the border, so to say, of the, of the European Union or the Convention of State, and are receiving this this kind of pressure. So the court is trying to to uh, to define all the procedural so individual characteristics of each case, but in principle there is not a common right to immigrate in this uh, in this country. So that was your 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 question. I think. You want to talk about this this point before going to the second one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's very interesting because the environment. <laughs> and uh, well, what can the court do? Wait, wait. New cases. Wait that the uh, a state can uh, ask an advisory opinion. No. What has the court do? Have done? Oh, a very important jurisprudence of this uh, for immigrant and refugees. You know, we have uh, like uh, well, three advisory opinions that are very important. The, uh, it was eight, the 18th, you know, presented by Mexico in, two, uh, two, in 2003, Ju judici uh, Judicial Conditions and Rights of the Undocumented Migrants. There are very important uh, standards in that uh, advisory opinion and uh, in, in the 18, uh, advisory opinion number 18, you know, the process of law in some circumstances, and one very recent, the number uh, advisory opinion number 21, that was uh, for uh, children immigrants, children immigrants. So we have a jurisprudence and in that one, in children's immigrants, the court for the first time said that the jurisprudence of the court and the conventionality control or the judicial review of conventionality, I don't know how to <laughs> translate it, um, has to do it not only in contentious cases, but also in advisory opinions. So these ones, 16, 18, and 21, are very important uh, for, the, for this issue of immigrants. And right now we have three advisory opinions no, we already have the hearing of uh, one of Colombia, very important, not in that issue. I was uh, environment and the in the Grand Cari in the Gran Caribe, you know, uh, law of the sea, um, from Costa Rica and from Ecuador. We're going to have the hearings in Agosto um, about the asilo político. What do you say? Political, Political uh, yes, but it's very Latin American issue, no? That one, but well. There is a immigration, refugees, and, and also cases. No, we have a lot of cases, uh, jurisprudence. That remember, the court also said that it's not only for the party that has been condemned. It's also la res interpretata. For all their other, the interpretation can 
be applied and must be applied for other states that has signed the American Convention. No? Pacheco Tineo versus Bolivia. Very recently, we have a very uh, important case uh, against Republica Dominicana. Haitianos, uh, uh, Boni, uh, Gianni Bosico, 2016. So there is a lot of jurisprudence right now in advisory opinions and in contentious cases that, of course, that is the jurisprudence to be applied. No? But of course, we can wait for another. Maybe the commission can send us an advisory opinion. <laughs> and in fact, on the commission's website, there's a, a manual on standards concerning migration, migrants, persons, and human mobility that attempts to collect all of this work up until last year, if you're interested in inter-American mm -hmm. standards. OK, going to the second question, I think it's, it's important. Uh, well, I think you are, or most of you, are, are, are people who know the, the, the law and know one thing. That is no one, no lawyer, but no one likes to lose a, to lose a case. So normally, if you lose a case before the court, then uh, you appeal, and then instead you go to the Supreme Court, if necessary to the, so that there is a tendency to, to I mean, to, to go at the, at the, at the courts, and as a result, upper courts normally have a lot of claims, a lot of application. I, I had some experience at the Spanish Constitutional Court, then uh, looking when I was working at the Ministry of Justice. Uh, uh, looking at the needs and the claims of the Supreme Court and now in, in Strasbourg. And it means that you receive enormous amount of claims now with the direct system that is not the filter, so that many of them really have no merits, but the parties don't want to lose the case and they, they try to do everything. So many of these, uh, or many of these cases really don't deserve and study in depth because clearly the, the invocation of conventional rights is not a, it's not really that, uh, it's not, not uh, justified. As a result, you have to find a way to without, I mean, to, to eliminate those cases which have no merits and go into the one who has merits. So uh, this is the, the, the proceedings of inadmissibility, which was are general in practically in all, all uh, high, in all high courts. Now, the, this rate of inadmissibility, the inadmissibility rate in the, in the convention, in the, in the Strasbourg Court is very high. I think in some cases, 95%, it's very, very high. It was proposed sometime to just to introduce a system like the, the certiorari system of the Supreme Court, giving the freedom to the court to choose which, which uh, cases they, they want or not, but it has not been adopted. There are some reasons for a, uh, inadmissibility and you have to give the, this inadmissibility for declare something inadmissible for some reason but up to now and this is one of the main problems of discussion also in, in europe the court just decided to say uh, uh, a committee or one single judge or one chamber considers the case as inadmissible because it doesn't fill the conditions of article size and chat without more reasons and now there have been many, many criticisms on that. Said, Listen, you give reasons when you go into the merits of case. Why don't you give reasons when you decide to reject the case? Mm -hmm. The problem here is mostly uh, logistical. If we receive 65,000 cases a year and we reject 60,000 of them, it means that the practically all of our time will be justifying why not uh, admitting several cases instead of going into the, merit, the merits of the one who, who deserve it. On the other side, many lawyers and say, Jimmy, but we would, would be interested in knowing exactly why you reject it in order for the next time to know how do I have to justify the, the claim. So that uh, that is one of the big discussions now. Uh, the court has been introducing, in some cases, trying to introduce some kind of, uh, well, of a stereotyped formula sense and the reason is well you have presented your claim out of time or you have not exhausted internal remedies or you don't have legal counsel or something like that it's time to to do this thing but that's that's one aspect the second one the repetitive cases of course uh, the thing is that many of the countries with the uh, in the convention are countries who come from a past whether there was not a very clear rule of law in a result legal practice sometimes it's a very low level. And as a result, thousands of cases come 
with a violation with the same time of violation. I mean, like uh, this case, for instance, uh, in, in human treatment, the conditions of prisoners in the Eastern European countries, well, in Romania, in the F Russian Federation, Moldavia, and so on, the, the prison conditions are really inhuman. And then the, we have hundreds, thousands of these repetitive cases coming. All of them are the same thing. We are 25 persons in one cell for three. We don't receive enough food. We are subject to inhuman treatment by 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 the by the police and so on. So, um, what is how to to remedy these repetitive repetitive cases? If the last one, the most extraordinary we have, is coming the, the coming from Ukraine. In Ukraine, you know, there was this famous the Chernobyl accident, and many people were affected. They they got uh, radioactivity and so on. And then they made claims to the Ukrainian government. The Ukrainian government uh, uh, allowed the compensation. In theory, the parliament they went to the court asking for their payment for compensation for this accident, and the courts either didn't give them anything, or if the court recognized this this payment, the government didn't pay. And we have thousands of cases of these people who, who became affected by, by Chernobyl, but they are not receiving any money in spite of decisions of the court. Now, what to do with these repetitive cases? It's complex. We have this device, device uh, several uh, techniques. One is the so-called pilot judgment. It consists on recognizing one violation in telling the government, listen, uh, we have 2,000 cases like this one, so we'll mm -hmm. give you some months or one year in order to find some kind of collective remedy. That's one way. Other system we have introduced, uh, we, we don't, we, we know the, the protocol 14 has introduced the possibility for judgment, which are based clearly on previous case law, uh, this judgment to be given not by a chamber or the grand chamber, by committees of three judges. So many of these, with three judges, you can uh, process mass cases, trying to, 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 move, to move them. The problem is that in some cases, like uh, the case I say of human treatment or payment of pension, is the situation of the state. In many cases, the states don't have enough resources to, to change completely the prison system or don't have enough money to pay for payment. So what we ask is for the government to devise some kind of plans for the future. So, but these are questions that have to do mostly with the execution of judgment. And then it's a matter for a specialized organ we have with it, the committee of ministers. But the court cannot just say, well, you have the right to receive the money without somehow knowing that there are many practical difficulties. So uh, the, this case of repetitive, uh, repetitive cases uh, is still there. Traditionally, there were countries like Turkey, uh, Russia, uh, or even Italy. Now there are some countries uh, which are uh, going into this way. For instance, I'm thinking of Hungary. For, uh, 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 well, uh, uh, the, the United Kingdom with the case of prisoners, which has been more or less uh, solved, but uh, effectively that's something that where the solution is mostly tend to be a technical solution, how to deal with thousands of cases uh, without compromising the quality of the decision and giving the state the possibility of really to comply with the, with the, with the sentences. That's a very long, long, long procedures. Uh, normally, the countries take from from four to ten years to really give general effects to one to one uh, to one, one one judgment. So that's uh, something that that's why I was saying that really this the, the process of international protection of human rights is a process with conflict, dialogue, and going uh, with trial and trial and, and error. Well, maybe that was actually a good concluding comment because I think that we are at our time limit, but. I would like to open the floor for Judge Ferrer McGregor if you would like to make a concluding comment um, in the same way that, that Judge Lopez Guerra was able to. Oh, well, okay, thank you very much. I think, well, as you see, there's huge differences between the European system and the inter-American courts. But I think we're in the same path, you know? And we, uh, with the, the final judgments, not, right now there is a lot of um, dialogue. I think there is a lot of dialogue uh, because of the traditional reparations of the court. Now, the, in the European court, are trying to uh, resolve a structural problem, and the uh, judgment of the court, they try to resolve systematic problems. 
because we just have 250 cases in 40 years now. So we're not only to save well, pays some money for the victims, no? We, we make the, the non-reparation, no, no repetition. No, Non-repetition. No repetition. Yeah. And there's the non-repetition uh, reparation uh, was the clue to um, create the doctrine of the conditionality. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's a clue that they don't have the Article Two uh, of the American Convention, the necessary to that adopt norms and other measures in the national level. So, um, well, but we're in the same path, and I think the most important is principle pro persona, not hierarchy. The principle pro persona, pro persona always thinking. No matter if it's international or constitutional law or national law, the, the most important thing is um, to protect human rights. And that was, in fact, the perfect concluding comment from both of you. So I want to thank especially our panelists, our distinguished panelists. I want to thank the American Society, thank WCL, the Academy, and thanks to all of you for, for sharing this space with us. We could spend many panels and many days on these questions that we've opened. So we'll be very attentive to developments in each system. Thanks very much. Thank you.